ask you, will you, will you please hold uh, a prayer for us to begin this event, and will you accept this gift? Chi miigwech. Uh, Sandy, I really appreciate uh, the offer of the SEMA, and I accept it, and I'm going to do a short uh, thank you prayer. Um, I do not speak our language, so I'm going to still try. It's here before me, and I'll tell, I'll tell everyone what I'm saying. Um, without further ado, Gichi Manado. Um, first off, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to open talking about who I am. So in addition to cause, uh, Papa Pishu, my name is Spotted Lynx. And um, I'm here today uh, in the gathering at the speakers panelists about food sovereignty, indigenous food sovereignty with Ryerson and many other guests. And we ask you creator to help open us in a good way. Um, we offer our prayers, tobacco in our hearts. Naminiwan. Uh, Maba, I say ma, minwan anadolin winainin bida dimi magom, miguech di egomin, mishomis nani minawe no nokomis misinanig, jinago ga iajik nungomik iajik minwa wabe wabeng. Gi Aiyajik, thank you for the grandfathers and the grandmothers of yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Miigwech Manidu Iyajik Nudinom Iyajik Nibing Iyajik Skodeng Miwa Iyajik Aking, thank you, spirits of the winds, water, fire, and earth. Miigwech Manidu Iyajik Giwe denong, wabenong, zawaganong, minwa, epashemik, ipakishemak. Thank you, spirits of the north, east, south, and west. Daga bi wido gawishaning, win mino, gima dishyang. Please help to, please help us to live in a good way. Aha. We ask that um, we move this gathering forward in a really good way with our hearts and our minds open, our spirits ready to listen and learn and share in a good way. Chimigwech. Thank you very much for, for that prayer, for really beautifully opening um, our event today. Um, I'm also going to read the land acknowledgement for us too. So. Although this is a virtual event, we recognize and acknowledge that Ryerson is in the Dish With One Spoon territory. The Dish With One Spoon is a treaty between the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas, Haudenosaunee that bound them to share the territory and protect the land. Subsequent Indigenous nations and peoples, Europeans and all newcomers have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. And so today, today we want you to think, you know, beyond just this land acknowledgement and ask uh, yourselves, like, how are we connecting to the land that we inhabit? the land that, um, that grows our food and whether our food, all of our food comes from the grocery store and we take that moment to really honor the food after its long journey to our plate, or maybe you're growing a little bit of your own food right now and engaging in nurturing and harvesting plants. We really hope that this conversation inspires you to take your connection with land and food one step further towards gaining an understanding of how you can be in relationship with plants, food and indigenous communities. So again, uh, welcome to the Ted Rogers School Indigenous Speaker Series, and thanks so much for everyone who's joining us today. Um, and we want to also um, provide a little bit of context about this event, because this is a series of events um, that we've been holding. So the Indigenous Speaker Series was created in response to Canada's Truth and Reconciliation Commission's call to action, particularly in number 92, pertaining to economic development. So this call to action serves as a source of inspiration and education with the aim of sharing stories and learning between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people in Canada and globally. So this series of conversations with Indigenous knowledge keepers, entrepreneurs and artists, it really guides our collaborative venture in developing a shared uh, space of the Indigenous Healing Garden at, um, and uh, the installation of Indigenous artwork at Ted Rogers School. And so the speaker series is still, we're still part of um, the exploratory phase of the Indigenous Healing Garden Initiative. And so these uh, speaking events are meant to share this knowledge and teachings of plants, Indigenous to Turtle Island, and to the teachings around them. 
Um, so without further ado, I'm delighted to introduce our two speakers for today. So we have first Chef uh, Joel White Duck, who is the Hi. owner and so welcome, thank you. He's the owner and social entrepreneur of the Niche Dish, Mercateria and Catering. It's an award-winning small business that's been reclaiming and serving traditional Anishinaabe uh, food since 2005 and serves as an educational hub for Indigenous teachings. Um, Chef Joel's journey of Indigenous food sovereignty has led him to founding two nonprofit agencies in the Greater Toronto Area. So the Ajibikan Indigenous Cultural Network that creates and supports their Indigenous teaching gardens and the Toronto Indigenous Business Association. And this is the first Indigenous um, and the first Indigenous Harvesters and Artisans Market. And that celebrates annually at the Big Group uh, Centre along with Red Urban Nation Artists Collective. Um, and they create and install massive Indigenous murals also at Big Group Centre and support emerging Indigenous artists. And then we also have Chef Tommy McHugh, who was born in Toronto. He spent his entire life in the hospitality industry uh, from a very young age. Um, Chef Tommy would work in his father's cafes and his passion for cooking um, led him to eventually train in London, England, where he started his cooking career. So for over six and a half years, he was trained there by some of the world's most respected chefs. And after gaining some knowledge from these um, exceptional chefs, uh, he returned to Toronto where his career continued to grow with the opening of multiple restaurants. And Chef Tommy's approach to cooking is keeping it simple, fresh and classic with exceptional taste and flavor, while also being true to his passion for sustainable cooking and living. And he joined us here at Ted Rogers in January 2020, um, earlier this year as the executive chef at Ted Rogers School. And he strongly believes in educating and empowering our students um, uh, because they are the future of our industry and he really wants to help them reach and surpass their professional goals and aspirations. Okay, so my first question for you two, both of you. So both of you teach about cooking and about food. So I wanted to ask, what's the most important historical lesson you tell when you're imparting this knowledge to the next generation of chefs and food activists? And I know this is a bit of a broad question, so maybe just speak a little bit briefly about what's, what's one of the most important things that you, that you tell to people when they want to learn about food and food activism. Should I speak first to that? Or Tommy, do you have Go something you want to share first? I think, I think he said, take it over, Chef Joel. Okay, okay. so in the work that the Niche Dish team has been doing for 15 years now, um, the journey for us and teaching uh, our community members and allies alike about Indigenous food sovereignty is really what is that? Because that's a key, is understanding that food sovereignty is actually, what it means is that all people have a right to know what their uh, traditional diet is and then get, gain access to that. And of course, here in Canada, we don't have that. Um, a lot of the knowledge has to be unearthed. So yes, there are certain food groups we know about, for sure. We know about game, we know about fishing. It's really a lot of the plant knowledge we don't have that much information of. And even with the current knowledge we do have that has been given to us by many of our aunties, our uncles, our grandparents who, who know about the food on the land, most of us don't have access to it. So that's been the journey of Niche Dish is really we're trying to, we know that wild rice is a main staple of our, our uh, Anishinaabe diets. However, it's not accessible. It does grow in a few of the local communities, but it's not enough to sustain all the indigenous people who now reside in the GTA. So we have a huge job to do. We actually have to find low level lakes and regrow wild rice. And the further information to that is that we actually have to relearn the ceremonies of the wild ricing planting and actually harvesting and all the songs and the dances that are part of that because our entire history is linked to that ceremony. So it's not just planting a seed, but it's finding out what were the ceremonies of the seed, the seed planting ceremonies, what were the garden ceremonies, what are the songs. So that's a big part of our education at Nish Dish. And it's also why we um, founded Ojibikan, which means the roots in uh, Anishinaabe Moen. We founded that organization to take over the Nish Dish Gardens we had created so that they would become community um, accessible so people could learn about these things. 
So, you know, in a nutshell, that's, that's really the work that we're trying to do when we talk about teaching the team. And then from there, it goes into certain recipes and, you know, different cuts, different ways of uh, presenting the food, things that would happen traditionally in any, uh, any sort of um, program, culinary program. Awesome. Thank you. I like this idea of like trying to go back to thinking about how does this all work and bringing people into that a lot. What about, what about you, Chef Tommy? Do you, do you pull in a lot of people into the way that you teach as well? I think we might, oh, his connection just cut out. Okay. Maybe we'll give him a second there. Okay, so I can I can add a little bit more to that while we're waiting sure. for Chef Tommy to reconnect. Um, the main the main teacher in our in our Anishinaabe culture is Nana Bojo. Many people have heard about this teacher. He's half spirit. He's half human, and he was actually sent by uh, Gichi Manadu to name everything across the planet. Mm. So it's this character that we learn so much from and we love including that in all of our teachings. It's like learning more about Winnebojo or Nanabojo is what tells us about the whole history of our story in oral uh, teachings throughout, uh, throughout time memorial, immemorial. So we love um, sharing what we've learned. There are great books out there you can get. Um, one of the most fantastic ones that I've found about recently, I'm looking for it right here, it's actually uh, stories about Winnebojo written by Isaac Murdoch. And it's beautiful. It just got published recently. And I have several copies. But anyway, you can get that online uh, through Isaac Murdoch at, I think, their Omanonym Collection, co Collective, Artist Collective. Um, it has it has a lot a lot of fantastic teachings there. The other book that's incredible was written by um, Ed Benai Benton, and it's called Mishomas, the story of Mishomas, and that'll tell you the whole migration of the Anishinaabe people in many nations that came from the East Coast. So over like many many centuries of movement, slowly across to the Anishinaabe, uh, stopped eventually after four different stops throughout the history. Um, in near Sault Ste. Marie. So it's a very special island there, and that's where we stayed, and that's where a lot of ceremonies are held to this day uh, and where we can learn the entire history of our people. So very exciting stuff we learn, and this is all connected with food. There's whole stories of Nana Bojo and, say, the red, um, red osier plant, for example, which is one of our willow trees, right? And it talks all about his relationship with it. And they're pretty wild and crazy, exciting stories. So we share that. We share stories about the birch tree and its medicine through Nana Bojo, the Natig, the maple tree, a bunch of different plants in our teachings and the medicines that we get from them. Do you find, I'm really glad you brought up this idea of story as a way to talk about food. Do you find that people connect with that better than like, something more step-by-step, step. Um, like hearing that story, do people take that knowledge in in a different way? Do you notice that at all? And you I, say, I'd really, rather tell about Nana Bojo than like something from the book. Yeah, I, I mean, I feel that our community uh, connects really incredibly with the storytelling. And what I love about it is because it it's done in groups, we get to share, there's gonna be someone else in that very group that's going to be able to share more knowledge to the same story. Mm. So you just, you just this constant learning process that we all get to share a part of our history in the storytelling and it makes it that much richer and, you know, more profound for us to share collectively what yeah. we learn from our, our, our teachers and our, our loved ones, right. And passing it around. And that's some of like the power of doing this in community, right? Like, as you say, that other people get to add those different pieces in. That's really lovely. Um, well, maybe we'll pass on to the next uh, question while we're waiting for Joel to come, I'm sorry, for Tommy to come back with us. Um, so the next thing that I wanted to ask you a bit about, um, Chef Joel, is that there's lots of fruits and vegetables, and I think you also told us nuts, that are really integral to Indigenous cultures, but a lot of Canadians don't know that they're Indigenous foods. Um, can you maybe tell us three foods that you really love to work with that people don't realize are native to Ontario? 
uh, uh, for sure, but like I would, it, I would have to speak about the three sisters because it is the most requested dish at Nish Dish. Oh, nice. It's such an important part of our culture. So one of the places I talk about and I visit and I've learned so much about our food systems is not very far from here. It's a place called Crawford Lake Sanctuary. It's just between Guelph and Milton. And so if you've been there, you know that there was a Huron, formerly a Huron Wendat society that lived there, a village lived there for many, many years. And through archeological archaeological digs, they discovered so many things. I think there's 10,000 artifacts that are on display there now. So they've rebuilt the systems of the longhouses they found. And so if you think about Milton being like 45 minutes from here, you know that if that, were, that was the food system that the Huron Wendat had, you know that the Anishinaabe, the Algonquin people, all the many nations that lived around there, we were all eating very similar foods because it's what was available, right? So in the study of that, we discover how profound the Three Sisters is. The Three Sisters is corn, beans, and squash, but it's a very specific corn. It's the white corn, which we're going to touch on later. But the point of this is the indigenous agroecology that was done. So it's the specific a companion planting that our people discovered when growing together uh, produce a more vibrant and they revitalize the soil systems. So what came here after, when settlers came here and brought mono agriculture, this, this changed the entire way of producing food. Yes, you were producing food in larger quantities uh, for in certain specific ways, but that, agrico that agroecology actually depletes the soil. So it will disrupt what's happening, the uh, microorganisms within the soil, and it will deplete it and the soil will be useless and infertile very quickly. Whereas this companion planting we had, we stayed in many areas for many different seasons, different nations, right? So Anishinaabe people traveled around and did seasonal planting where longhouse people stayed in one area longer and re relied on more agriculture. So you're looking at this um, line of food items, it's incredible to find out that the amount of vegetables we were consuming was extremely significant. We're talking like 70% during the growing season was really what we were, we were eating. And so we would keep that, store it, and be using some of those rations throughout the winter times um, when we relied more on game and fowl and fish. So you look at the chart that they found, that they discovered, which is really based on, according to U of T professors, where they were given permission by the Huron-Wendat people to do uh, testing on the teeth of some of the ancestors they found there. And this gave them the documentation of the, the food that they were consuming through those studies. And so three sisters way up there all kinds of vegetation matter and then wild rice and then you have fish and then you have deer you have game at the lower end of the spectrum game of course is extremely significant to our many nations we do need it and the reason we need it is there's specific protein strains that are only in game that are not mm. found in all the other meats we consume so we don't need like 10 inch steaks and big, large portions of meat, but we need access to game meat to have the absolute extraordinary healthy diet that we should have access to. We do need some um, access to game meat, and it's certainly not comparison to the other meats we now have access to. They, they don't compare for what our diets need. So those things are really, really incredible to find out about. And that's what's really driven me towards learning about lamb's quarter, learning about plantain, learning about sumac, all the specific plants that are right around us uh, that we can consume, dandelion, that everyone mainly has been taught are weeds, and then we eradicate them. We get rid of them, and we do all kinds of damage to the earth trying to um, get rid of weeds when really they're the things we're supposed to be consuming and eating. Um, so exciting to learn these things, and this was part of our traditional diet. That's awesome. I'm, I'm really glad you highlighted three sisters. Uh, in uh, preparation for this event today, I used the recipe from you to make three sisters soup. So that was my lunch today. Oh, to, wow. To fill me up and get me ready and to get me thinking. I made it yesterday thinking about this event today. So I tried to make were an experience. You able, 
were you able to get access to white corn or were you just able to use the yellow corn? I just used yellow corn, but I did use green and purple beans from my Ooh, garden. Amazing. That, uh, in, your, in the last chat you did during Indigenous, uh, the Indigenous Week events, when you mentioned that planting those three things together, that they actually increase their yield. I hadn't put beans right in with my squash and corn, but that day I planted those. So oh, I was eating the beans that I had planted that day. That in, yeah, they'll give know? the nitrogen, right, to the yeah. corn. The corn will grow well with that. Yeah, well, you mentioned it was gonna increase the yield and I was like, yes. the gardener, Thank farmer and me says, I want more food. Uh -huh. So I did that right more. away. Yeah, that's yeah. fantastic. Yeah. And you're making your soil healthier, right? You're making your soil healthier by doing that. So you had asked a few things, a few of them. So I just had said uh, the three sisters and I went right to the corn, but a couple of other things that I love working with, but mind you have to be really careful. So that's wild ginger. Many of our people don't know that gingers actually grows here and it's wild mm -hmm. and it's our food, but you have to be very careful when you find it, you need to know how to pick it because the, the species is limited now because people over pick it and they kill it because they pick it incorrectly. So wild ginger, when I can find it, there's always secret spots. We don't tell a lot of people because then people go and destroy it by consuming it all. Um, and that's a great one to make tea with or add to any of your main meals, um, but specifically um, that plant. And so someone, one of our uh, amazing team at Nish Dish first brought it to me about three years ago from uh, uh, Cape Coker. That's where he was from and he brought it from there. So um, as I began to learn more about that plant, that's one of the things I love, I love to work with. So let, let Chef Tommy take, take the stage here. Well, Tommy, my kind of question to you related to this was going to be um, what some of these foods that, that um, Joel just spoke about, do you use some of those at TRSM? So the Three Sisters and um, Wild Ginger. Um, do you use these at TRSM or do you, do you engage with these as well in your cooking? So we don't, uh, but what happened is that when we, when I first got to the school, of course, I wanted to know everything that was happening at the school. And one of the things that everyone was telling me about was that there was a garden where we're growing food and it's relatively limited. And, you know, as we threw out there that we were going to start you know, growing more this summer, that's when, you know, the healing garden conversation we heard about and we were invited into and that's when, you know, I started hearing about um, the idea of uh, possibly, you know, doing more there. And then when I heard uh, Chef Joel speaking, I, you know, Im immediately was like, oh, this is amazing. This is, this is like this, you know, I'm going down this path mm -hmm. of, of knowledge and learning and I love it and I want to keep going. Mm -hmm. And so it, it kind of like, in, uh, what I was saying to, to Chef Joel the other day was, you know, the more I hear about these things, the more I start to find out what was, you know, local, the more I want to know about it. And the more mm. I want to sort of encourage the behavior of, 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 of us, you know, uh, having a better appreciation and consuming more and getting people to, as a whole, understand more. And I, I know we've touched upon the subject of, of come this spring about what can we grow there? You know, what can we do? Can we, can we do wild rice? Can we do, you know, uh, J-choke chips, you know, or like J-chokes or sun chokes, you know? You know, so in Europe, they're Jerusalem artichokes or J-chokes, and then here they're sunchokes. And, you know, that was one of the things we were talking about, where in Europe, if you go in a Michelin-starred restaurant, you know, the finest puree is a, is a sunchoke puree. And then it turns out that it's, you know, it's not French. And I didn't know that, you know, and this is, this is part of the path of education that I love about this and opening up this conversation. But then also talking about the tradition with, that you talked about, it's funny where, you know, chefs, you know, I, I'm a classically trained chef. I went to George mm -hmm. Brown and then I went to Europe. Uh, and one of the big things when I was in Europe was they really teach you the tradition of cooking. And so there's this, there's a respect that you have to give within the industry. You know, when you put on your, when your chef's jacket, you're not just putting on an article of clothing. This is almost like a uniform. You mm -hmm. show it respect. You know, there's a reason that it's completely white is because, you know, what's the one color a chef's uniform should not be white because it's going to be covered in food and everything. But it, it you know, they, it's white. So you can show everybody that you are so good at your job that there's not a mark on you. And we weren't allowed, we weren't allowed to get our chef's jacket dirty. If, if, if I got my chef's jacket dirty, I was in trouble. And you know what I mean? I had to go get changed right away. So, you know, the tradition of, of food 
is is something that was in you know in in that style was something that was uh educated into me so when i hear someone like chef joel talking about tradition and food every chef out in the world no matter what version of food they're trained in is wants to be a part of the conversation is respectful mm. of the of the of, of of what is being said you know and it just makes me want to know more you know a lot of times you know I, i'm here you know, and I end up just basically sitting there just listening to Chef Joel because I'm learning so much and I want to keep mm -hmm. learning more, you know. But I think that the tradition of food is something that um, is, is very, very important. And I think that right now with the pandemic, I think everyone has been gardening at home. I think that everyone has been basically, I mean, I, I, I did hope a garden. So. <laughs> I, 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 I did a, I did a garden in the back. Uh, my neighbor is from the Azores and he uh, was a farmer and he has this incredible massive garden in his backyard. I mean, it's massive. And then here's my little eight by two, you know, and I'm like, I grew romaine, you know, oh, you're growing potatoes and squash and zucchini and runner beans and all the, okay, all right. I mean, well, you know, there's our goals. But I think the conversation opened up and, and, and it's something that it, it's made me, I think, you know, in a sense, if you want to look at a silver lining with a pandemic, I think that it's made people appreciate more where their food is coming from and growing it more at home. And I think that, you know, if you're going to be growing something at home, you know, why not grow something that is, you know, is local? Shouldn't we be growing more, you know, sun chokes? Shouldn't we be growing more uh, chocolate tomatoes? Shouldn't we be growing more you know, certain versions of corn, you know, and this is one of those things where when I heard Joel talking about, I got really excited and all of the catering department was on the call with me. And when we got off the call, we all got back on another Zoom call. And we're like, all right, right. So we, we're, we're going to do this, right, guys? We're all going to start growing things. So I think that there's a great opportunity right now within the um, hospitality industry and out of the hospitality industry where there's an appreciation for tradition within food and learning about another form of tradition and you know and, and then you know it, it, taking some of that on in a sense where it's like I want to grow this I want to grow that what can I do and I think it's important to uh to promote this you know I, I think this is a great opportunity to start talking about this more and I think there should be more of an appreciation of of of, of where uh, foods come from, especially in indigenous culture, you know, like, I think that when people, you say tomato, go, the first thing they say is Italy, and you're, you mm. know, and of course, you're like, mm. no, not so much, not so much, you know what I mean? So I think that, you know, there are foods that have an association with it. And I think that it's important to put the proper association back with the proper foods, especially if it's, if it's from here, what, you know, like, that's something we should be promoting. And I think that's a great thing. And I think that it's something that I think more and more people will uh, be really genuinely interested in. So I think that, you know, every chef out there will hear this and, and basically say, this is a great idea. What can I do to help? Yeah, food is really exciting. And when you get excited about food and then you start thinking about where does food come from? I remember when I first started gardening, it, it just feels like this magic that... I don't know how people, more people don't want to be a part of it. So I think like what you said, Chef Tommy, that a lot of people in this moment right now are, you know, starting to say, I think like, okay, maybe I should grow some of my own food with all these sort of like what ifs. And I've just been so happy to see one of my good friends sort of gardening for the first time this year and just like cheering her on the whole summer. It's just been almost as exciting as if I was growing the garden. Yeah. And the other thing too, is that I think, you know, I have a uh, almost two year old and a four and a half year old mm. and to see my kids eyes light up every day coming in and saying, well, how, how come this tomato is now red when before yesterday it was green. And I think that th it also helps with uh, more of appreciation of the environment. And so mm -hmm. you have this list of things that we should be doing and it, it checks them all off. So I think that there's a lot of people that are going to be very supportive of this. Yeah. I think you're talking to about traditions is, is a really good segue into to our next question too because um, I wanted to you know chef Joel you've already talked a bit about how songs and dances and these different um, ceremonies related to plants so I wanted to know maybe what are some of those that are important to you and if chef Tommy you have any sort of traditions that, that are also meaningful for you around food that maybe you always do when you prepare food or things that you like to share maybe with your kids? Uh, so, uh, I'm, like, 
the story of how I came to do this work is a, is a long one. I believe it's on the website of nishdish.com. But, but so very quickly, um, I was working in the criminal courts at uh, Gladue Court for 10 years, uh, Aboriginal People's Court. And during that time, we were responsible for a diversion program where we had to get food of our community members that would come in and support that diversion program. So every time we went to do that, we'd have to order like sandwiches or soup or something that just, I couldn't find indigenous food anywhere. I couldn't find the food that I was raised on. My dad was a hunter. We, we went fishing. My mom took us on berry picks all the time. We tapped trees. We did a lot of things. And I didn't know that's what we called traditional food because nobody spoke about it. We just did those things in our household. No one said mm. this is the Anishinaabe diet. Like that wasn't said. So when I came to Toronto, we couldn't find our food. So I started looking, still didn't find it. I went, uh, talk, I went to talk to my medicine teacher. His name is Mark Thompson. Mark Thompson is the one who told me I had this journey to go on. He told me that I had a gift for traditional food. He wasn't aware. At least we didn't have conversations about the fact that I'd worked in the food industry since I was 15. So he told me I had this gift and I wanted to pass on those Gladue tools to someone else and go on the journey to bring back the Anishinaabe diet to the community here. And during that time, the one thing if I chose to do that was I would have to continue to smudge the food and put down spirit plates. And at some point, Nish Dish, he said, would become so successful that I would need an in-house elder. And we've been in that place now. We just haven't been able to find someone who can be with us 100% of the time. So the team at Nish Dish does the plates and we smudge the food and that's what we continue to do uh, on behalf of our teachings. So it's also the reason why we didn't keep the liquor license that was in the location uh, when we purchased it. When we purchased the lease, we could have taken on an, uh, a liquor license. People often ask me why we aren't serving it. It's because, of course, we work with the traditional sacred medicines, and those two things don't go together. So we're smudging all day long with the food. We're putting together our ancestral spirit plates, and they go down to the land at Christie Pits, where we're trying to create the first Indigenous hub um, in the city for our community. That's where all the indigenous murals are at the Bickford Center right across from Christie Pitts. And it's all this community work we do right around there with the two not-for-profits and this dish. But one quick thing just back is mushrooms. We were gonna talk about them. We may be running out of time. Stun chokes, you've already mentioned, uh, Chef Tommy. But mushrooms you'd be really familiar with. And those are some of the things I can forage. I don't forage them all because some of them are poisonous. You need someone who knows a lot about the mushrooms but I can forage um, when they're, when the seasons is ready is morels, um, puff balls, of course, I know what they look like, and chanterelles are pretty easy to identify. So those species everyone's pretty familiar with, but there's um, hen of the woods, probably people are familiar with. There's head, hedgehog mushrooms, which I love, um, lobster, oyster, there's so many, but those are all indigenous to the land here. There's many, many more than that, but the common ones, of course, that most of us know about are morels and chanterelles. Um, so that is the main thing. And the question that you had asked, Sandy, is what do we do around those ceremonies? That's it. When it comes to gardening, whole different story. We bring in the knowledge keepers and they teach us those planting songs, the way to ask for permission to that seed and the way to drum the song and the way the right the right specific phase of the moon when we were supposed to plant there's all kinds of beautiful ceremony and many knowledge keepers who still know this work so we bring them in and they teach us how to do that how to begin that garden in that sacred way of our people and to begin the planting the planting ceremony uh, in those ways to honor our knowledge of our of our, our traditional ceremonies so that's a really exciting thing that we learn and that's why we have Ojibakan. Ojibakan does that work and shares that work with the community. Hey, Chef Joel, do you mind if I just say something? I just find it amazing that all of the items that you listed, the, uh, uh, all of the foods, are literally the most exclusive foods when you're in Europe that they import in. Yeah. So, if you, it, I mean, it, it's almost like, do, do, or do people really understand how amazing the, the product and produce and 
you know, in Canada are. Are, 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 are the vast majority of people really appreciating what we have? Because so many of them are being exported mm -hmm. and being appreciated um, but, you know, if I were to turn around and say to somebody, you know, one of my friends would say hens of the wood, they're going to say, what's the hen of the wood, you know, or, or you know, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I just feel like there's a great opportunity for everybody to, you know, I think more, I think we should be prouder of what we have, mm -hmm. and there should be a deeper appreciation. So when I hear mm -hmm. anyone and Chef Joel saying, you know, this is something that I want to help promote. I think it's brilliant. You know, I think there is this, this amazing opportunity to really educate people, you know, and I think, I think it's awesome. I just love how literally everything you listed was like the most expensive import ingredients in, in England or France or wherever. Right. I mean, and they're in our, they're in our backyard. That's literally. Right. If you, if you know where they are, you can go forage them yourself. If you know how to pick them, then you can go forage them yourself. And I love uh, what you've been sharing, Sandy, and you both shared that what's happened during this time of the pandemic is a lot of people's minds have been turned to mm -hmm. where do we get our food? How do we grow it? You know, we're eating it every day. We're consuming it. We just think it keeps coming from the store and it doesn't. So it's incredible that there's been a huge movement and a consciousness towards understanding our plant relationships and uh, container growing because many of us don't have backyard gardens so we can container grow and that's one of the things I do uh, with my partner Laura and I have a business called the mini con the mini con in our language means the seed and if you go to minicon.com you can see all the projects we've been working on in the community and we have this beautiful book that we bring all over that tells people how to grow gardens in really small places. So it's all about urban gardening. And this is called An Illustrated Guide to Growing Food on Your Balcony. It's a fantastic book. It's a bestseller. It sold thousands and thousands of copy copies. And we're on, I think, our third edition of this third print run. And since then, my partner has done this book, which also completely baffles and blows my mind. Incredible. It's called Grow Without a Garden, 101 Plants for Containers. And, um, well, lucky me, yours truly got to do the foreword in this book. And uh, this book has every possible fact you could want to know. Look, about juniper, which is one of our traditional foods. Juniper is a traditional food. And there's 15 different um, facts just about juniper and how you can grow it. It's winter growing. Um, and that goes on and on. The whole book is full of that. Uh, so if you're interested in getting these, you can get them at minicun.com. Um, one of them is selling, this one also sells at uh, the book, what's the bookstore mm, on the Danforth Yellow Book Place, forgotten the name. Famous bookstore, sorry, I've forgotten the name, but you'll be able to book find City? it. Yeah, Book City. So this book is at Book City if you're interested in getting that at Book City. Um, but I, I'm really like, I, I love that a lot of these plants are in Europe, uh, but they were taken from here and they're, they're grown there now. Um, but this, this beautiful plant, the sunchoke, incredible history for our people, absolutely important to our diet. We actually need that. And that plant mm. will help level people's blood sugar. And so many of our people have diabetes and it's because we don't have access to our traditional foods. And these are the things I talk about. This is what's completely decimated our health systems throughout the nation. And the more of us that learn this and the more we work together as community to regrow these plants, the better our next generations are going to be because they're going to get access to the food they deserve that will help them be the best that they can be, right? So exciting times to learn about sunchokes. Um, we grow them all over. They're a survival plant. I won't keep talking because I know we have more to cover. Um, is there, should we move forward? We have a couple of questions from people, but I wanted to give Tommy a few chance if you wanted to say if you had any traditions around food you wanted to share quickly with us before we go on to the participant questions. Sorry, uh, question about what? One more time. Sorry, you cut out. My connection is so bad. I apologize. It's okay. Where there was, um, were there any traditions around food that you wanted to share that you really, that you really like, and that? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's 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 a, you know, I I felt like there was not a strong tradition around food here in Toronto, which is why I left to go to Europe because I mm -hmm. felt like they have a much stronger 
uh, you know, connection to food. Um, and, you know, I wanted to learn as much as I could. And I wanted to immerse myself as much as I could. And I felt like there wasn't, um, I, I, I think, you know, I, I realized very quickly there wasn't uh, enough of a general appreciation. So, you know, uh, going off to, uh, you know, I mean, England, you know, is not famous for its food. <laughs> You know, <laughs> I mean, they have delicious food, but it's funny, but like, you know, I, you know, I, so I grew up uh, in a very British household, you know, um, and, um, you know, it, it was one of these things where I started to realize that there is, uh, uh, you know, these traditions, but they're very, they're very subtle. Um, and I think one of the reasons that I was traveling around uh, Europe is because every time I went to a different country, they had a different food culture and I wanted to know more about it. And some of my Spanish friends had such an incredible food culture that was so ingrained and was so mm. deep that I literally just sat there like a sponge and I would just take it in. And then I would go to Italy and same thing, take it in. I'd go to France and take it in. So, I mean, I myself, you know, in our household, we don't, no, I think the only thing that we really had growing up, we had like the traditional Sunday roast, which is more sort of mm. a thing that we did. Um, mm. But besides that, it wasn't, there wasn't a very strong food culture. You know, there was a food appreciation, mm. but there wasn't a strong food culture. And I, I think that, you know, it's one of these things where I've, I've tried to really um, teach my kids is that, you know, appreciate this and this is where it comes from and this is the story behind it and, you know, and give context to the different foods. Um, but I didn't really grow up with that, that strong. So I'm very jealous when I hear Chef Joel talking, you know, I'm very jealous because I, I simply didn't have that. I, I grew up, I think, in a similar place where, like, in a similar way to you where we really enjoyed the food and my mother is a fantastic cook and baker, but there was no discussion about where the food came from. Yeah. And so when I started to, to garden, it felt like such a wonderful privilege. And, you know, you feel this maybe jealousy about Joel, but I, I think it's an opportunity to share that then with the next folks, right? We've got right. small children. I right. try to share that with friends and my kids, although they're very mm. disinterested in, in the plants, although yeah. sometimes I make them listen, I at least make them eat <laughs> the food, right? But I feel like maybe that's, that's our role. Uh, right. Tommy to to push that forward right and the other thing I find is very interesting when you listen to chef Joel talking he's always talking about the health benefits of food first and foremost mm. we that's not something that you know you'll hear me saying have this dish loaded with butter and cream you know it, it, there's <laughs> not it's not a nutrition focused mm. forward mm. you know presentation of things it's a it's a flavor thing so I love that yeah. you know Joel has this um, knowledge that I don't have where he's saying, listen, these foods are amazing for every category, flavor, taste, you know, um, and also they'll help do this and for your, you know, your blood sugar and for your digestion and the list goes on and on and on. And that's something that was never discussed. Even, even when I was in Europe, that was never discussed. It was always mm. about it tastes good or it's traditional, but there was never a health reason behind it, you know, and I, and I love hearing this and I think this is an incredibly important conversation that everybody needs to have about food that food you know can either be incredibly beneficial to you or can be very dangerous to you depending on what you eat and how much you eat of it and what you put together you know um, so I, I try to keep butter out of as much cooking as possible you know but it, sometimes it's hard <laughs> yeah and that's what's exciting yeah. about food sovereignty too right is that it brings those things together that it's about how to be healthy in your food as well, right? If I, yeah. if I understand that correct, Joel? Yes, absolutely. And I mean, of course, we had all kinds of different oils we used in our food, but they were they were taken from seeds. And those seeds yeah. are from specific plants that we, we don't really access anymore. So if you're actually looking for an oil to cook with and you're indigenous, you should be really looking at oils like sunflower oil because that is the main staple of our diet. That means our people were consuming this for many thousands of years, right? So it's, and also you can cook with it at high temperatures. So it's important to learn these things about food. We had so many different ways of cooking. That's another thing is that we've been told that we didn't even have metal when in fact we know that we did. We know that we were the main um, harvesters of copper. Thunder Bay, as I talk about, has the largest copper deposit in the world. And there's a lot of it that's been harvested. And I talk about this too. There are only two theories about where 
the harvesting of that copper went to and indigenous people aren't included in those mm. theories. And we know that we had it, we traded with copper, we cooked with copper, we wore it as adornments, we used it for all kinds of things. So we talk about a story um, with the wild rice that involves a copper pot um, in Nana Bojo, and that's one of the teachings also when we talk about wild rice and how the Anishinaabe people are known as the wild rice people, the Monoman people. Uh, but so many things, uh, Chef Tommy, that you're talking about, uh, speak to me and the excitement of it and certainly um, not knowing that the very plants that you're using are indigenous that's a lot of the things things have been appropriated and moved all over the place and of course that's huge throughout all colonization that's happened all over the world to all indigenous people across the planet um, but in this case what we're trying to do is unlock this incredible uh, information and energy that we can harness and help our people's health benefits uh, help our people's health get so much better because, um, yeah, for instance, diabetes has been an epidemic for five decades in our community. So it's not a new thing. Um, but these foods, some of these foods are known to specifically take care of them. And we just didn't know that. And they're there. We can plant them. You know, the segues, oh, sorry. The segues really great into one the two questions we have, because one of the folks has asked, like, um, if you can maybe talk a little bit about food as medicine. And someone specifically asked about the kind of proteins in game meat. I don't know if you can answer um, those in combination. Um, I can only answer a little bit um, about the, the protein uh, game strains. Uh, I know this through a teaching. And when we, when we try to pass on teachings, we always try to talk about where they came from. It's a really important thing that we honor in our culture. And so it's Elder Rebecca Mortel, who I believe is from Saskatchewan, she spoke to this, and this is where I learned this information. Now, I can't remember exactly who the anthropologist or doctor was who did this, but he specifically got, uh, this is what I was told, he got permission uh, from the Cree and I think the blood people and did studies on why the mass numbers of our people perished. And it was specifically, of course we know, we know the buffalo were taken away and that's what the buffalo, the buffalo is what, what we were our absolute way of life. Not just the, the main form of food, but the buffalo did everything for our people in, in that location, in those communities. And of course, buffalo were as widely as into Ontario. They weren't just out in the plains. But so it was in that teaching that Rebecca Mortel talked about the specific protein strains that are only found in game meats. And then there was portions, and I remember learning about that, that, you know, really, if we could get one, even if it's a small portion of game meat a week, that's plenty. That will do it. That will harness your body's needs. So you don't need to eat a ton of it because it's really hard to get, number one, if you're living, especially in the city. But it's really important to get. Now, if you're a vegan, you want to combine the other things like the, like the, the three sisters. You really want the three sisters and that white corn in your diet to get those high protein strains that are inside that white corn and combine them because that's where you get the synergy that our people use to, to have longevity throughout days because we did long physical days of work and it was the three sisters that provided that energy and gain me. So Lil, that's what I can speak to in that. In terms of medicines, it's in all of the food. You just have to know which, right? Which food is holding what. So of course we know berries. If we look at the 13 calendar moon, we know in the berry seasons are several. But the main berry, of course, is the heart berry that's in June. That is loaded with antioxidants. All berries are loaded with antioxidants. They clean our blood. Really important to consume a lot of berries. Very hard to get wild berries unless you're picking them yourself. So wild berries, of course, they're going to have a lot more uh, medicinal value. But it doesn't mean that the cultivated ones don't. It just means they will have less. So anytime you can get berries, definitely consume uh, berries. And um, sunchokes, same thing. Sunchokes is loaded with um, uh, several different vitamins, and I can't name them all right now. But that particular plant, which very few of us eat, is in our three gardens, and it can grow anywhere, and it grows rampantly. So if you plant it, it will take over your whole garden. And you leave it to late November, if you can, before the ground freezes and you pull it up, because that's when it's going to be really large. It's very gnarly, looks like a starchy potato, but not a starchy potato. And of course, it will help, unlike potatoes, potatoes won't help diabetes, but the sunchoke will. 
the sun choke levels the blood sugar levels. Um, that's as much as I'll speak right now because I know there's a lot more to probably get to. Thank you. This is awesome. It makes me feel really good about my, my little berry patch in the front yard that I'm cultivating. I also learned recently from Elder Joanne Dallaire that the green part of a strawberry is actually medicine too. Yes. So I would have only thought about the, the berry itself. So I started actually eating the greens of the strawberries from my garden Amazing. recently so good. for medicine. I started doing that after that as well. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's good. All right, Chef Tommy, we have maybe like a few seconds. Do you have any foods you use for medicine? Um, you know, I, I think the only thing I, I try to do is I, I try to do a smoothie in the morning. Uh, mm. And I try to, I do try to pile it with as many berries as possible, like Chef Joel was saying. You know, mm. um, you know, I do use hemp hearts, chia seeds, and Good. a few other things to get some fiber in there as well. Um, and again, something that I'm really passionate about, um, you know, it's one of the reasons why you know, I work at a school, is that I teach my kids. You know, and I talk to them mm -hmm. and I don't just hand them something and say, mm -hmm. you know, here's your breakfast. I, you know, I make it fun where I'm like, you can see my son climbing in the back. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, you know, we make it fun where I'm like, hey, did you know that these are berries and berries come from, you know, like, you know, north of the city and that, you know, bears love them, but also they're so good for us. You know, I feel like there's an amazing opportunity to educate children about, about, you know, um, about food, about health, about, you um, all the different things um but yeah it, it's it's that's i think that's a, that's a big thing for us is, is really just to do berries in the morning Amazing. hey <laughs> <laughs> all right well uh, we're working from our, home <laughs> we're at our time well i thought my cat was going to interrupt so we got we got lucky um so i just want to say thank you so much chef tommy thank you so much chef joel for sharing your knowledge and your time with us today um, thank you Thank you for all the participants for coming and listening. Like we can't do this without you. And I know I feel really full. I am so ready to go take a little bit of a work break and head out to my garden and touch some plants and say thank you to them for all the food they're giving me and uh, continue to learn from the two of you as much as possible uh, to grow my relationship with food. Um, and we hope that our uh, audience members will come back next week on the 25th. Um, our next event's gonna be um, hosted by Elder Joanne Dallaire, right. and the topic is going to be on building Indigenous economic development partnerships. And if you mm -hmm. haven't got a chance to, to meet uh, Elder Joanne Dallaire, I would say this is your chance. So we hope to see you next week on the 25th. Pray for the water. That's what our plants need right now. Everything's mm. been a really dry, dry season. If you can pray for the nibi, the beach, the water, it will really help our plants at this time. Chee also, we have a link that we're going to share, if we can share it on the chat line, um, about the Cherokee uh, Trail of Tear Bean, because I know right. you'd love to learn about that. We have a link on a video regarding that specific bean and the history, and there's a ton of information you can find online about the Cherokee people and um, all of their gardening techniques, which are so important, and cooking techniques, which are the same things we would have been doing here, very similar because um, they covered a lot of ground, the Cherokee people. And of course, uh, we know about the, um, the fact that the U.S. government forced them to relocate um, thousands of miles. It was a walk from Toronto to basically Winnipeg. So think about that and learn a little bit more about it in the food through that link we'll send and share. Chimigwech, thank you, Sandy. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Chef Tommy, for having me here today and getting an opportunity to share. That was amazing. Thank you, Chef Joel, and thank you, everyone. That, honestly, that was brilliant. Thank you.